So we're going to talk about Medicaid. And imagine almost only about 50 years ago that you were poor and didn't really make a lot of money. The only way you can get medical care is if you went to a charity hospital. That was really the only choice you had available. Um, but in the mid-1960s, two programs were started, both Medicaid and another one that sounds very similar but is very different, called Medicare. And both of these were designed to make sure that people who couldn't get health care before could now get it. Medicare was at the time primarily designed for people over the age of 65, so the elderly, whereas Medicaid was primarily designed for the poor. We're going to focus mostly on Medicaid in this video, but I think by understanding how those programs are different, that's a good way to kind of get at, well, why are these programs really different and how should we think about them differently? I find that one of the best ways to think about any major big federal program is to focus on real examples. So let's take a family here. A young woman who doesn't really make very much money would be considered to be poor. Suppose she's 25 years old and she has two young children, maybe a five-year-old and a one-year-old. And they're going to need medical care, maybe for checkups because they're two young children. Um, and maybe the young woman has developed some medical problems as well. Let's, on the other hand, also take another example. A woman who is 70 years old, um, who uh, has been working uh, in the United States for some time, has paid all of her Medicare taxes as well. So both of these individuals at some point may need to go ahead and seek out care from a medical provider of some type. And let's talk about how the way their medical care would be paid for is different, because I think that'll really help understand the differences in these programs and how Medicaid is actually very uh, differently structured than Medicare. Medicare is fairly straightforward. If you are over the age of 65, the federal government, meaning the part of the government based in Washington, D.C., you know, they run the Internal Revenue Service and they run the military. They also run Medicare. They will be responsible for paying any bills that our hypothetical 70-year-old woman has in the course of getting her medical care. So the federal government sends that out, doesn't matter what state this woman lives in, and they assume 100% of the insurance responsibility and the costs for her medical care. That's very different than how things go when you're on Medicaid. In Medicaid, it's really a partnership between the federal government, as I said, the part in Washington, D.C. that has all those federal agencies, as well as the state government where this family may live, meaning suppose they live in Arizona or Oregon or North Carolina. The way Medicaid works is that there will be medical bills and the federal government ultimately is responsible for a portion of that, but the state that they live in is also responsible. The federal government will pay at least half and in some cases more of those costs and the state government will pay at most half and in some cases a little bit less than those costs. But the key thing to realize is that there is a federal-state partnership in paying for Medicaid. Why was it really structured like this? And it comes again down to money. Both of these are huge programs. So Medicare is over $600 billion per year of cost. And so is Medicaid, 400 to $500 billion in cost. Again, this is all absorbed by the federal government. But here with Medicaid, only half of those expense are paid by the federal government. The other half is paid by the state government. This has led to a different way of thinking about the role of each of these programs. Medicare is available to everybody over the age of 65. Doesn't matter who you are. You can make a lot of money. You can make very little money. You can have kids, no kids, doesn't matter. Everybody gets it. That is what is referred to as a social insurance program, meaning that you don't need to apply any special criteria to qualify. As long as you're over the age of 65 and have paid your taxes in good standing, you get it, that's social insurance. 
Medicaid is very different. You have to be poor. You have to show that you don't make a lot of money. Not anybody can get it. That insurance is called means tested. So you have to show that you don't have the means. You have to meet certain criteria. And for Medicaid, you have to show that you're poor. In many states, you have to show that you have children or other people who depend on you. Um, and these are the criteria for getting Medicaid. It is only available to a small portion of people. I also just am going to point out briefly that both Medicare and Medicaid also allow people who are considered disabled to get health insurance. Medicaid is special, however, because people who are disabled get extra benefits under Medicaid, such as long-term care if you need to be in a kind of a special housing facility if you have serious disabilities, whereas Medicare does not cover that. So I'll just write that disabled people can get long-term care and other special benefits from Medicaid. We're going to focus primarily on the fact, however, that Medicaid, again, is designed for the poor, whereas Medicare is designed primarily for people over 65. And you'll see that sometimes, even I get tripped up, I might call Medicaid Medicare by mistake. But again, let me say that again, Medicaid is for the poor, Medicare is for people that are older. Well, let's come back and focus a little bit on Medicaid. Um, and some of the features about it. So I'm going to go ahead and, um, and erase some of this to keep our board a little bit clean and sort of talk about how the structure of Medicaid, the federal state partnership, has affected how people get insured and has really um, changed people's lives depending on where they live. Because Medicaid is means tested and because states have to pay for half of those costs, different states are different in who they allow to get on Medicare. So different states have different rules. Let's take uh, one example of that. So let's say that our hypothetical family here lives in New York. In New York, you can make up to 400% of what's called the federal poverty limit. That's a number that is sort of how much money you can make to be considered to be in poverty. You can make up to four times that amount, 400%, and as long as you make less than that, your family can get Medicaid. Let's contrast that with North Carolina. North Carolina has a different interpretation. In North Carolina, that family can only make up to 200% of the federal poverty limit. To get on Medicaid. So by some measure it's twice as hard to get Medicaid in North Carolina, two times as hard, as it would be in New York. Why do states vary so much? And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Remember as we talked about before that states have to eat about half the costs of their Medicaid. So New York has made a decision. They've said, well, we need to pay extra money, so we're going to use some of our state revenues, either from our state income tax or perhaps our state sales tax or whatever other means we have, because we feel it is a priority for us to reduce the number of people who are poor and uninsured. That's just a decision that they've made uh, as a state. North Carolina has made a slightly different calculation. They've said that we would like to spend less money. Perhaps we would like to allow a greater proportion, a greater amount of our state revenues to be used for either lower taxes or to use those money for other services. As a result, North Carolina as a state has decided that they will accept a slightly larger number of poor and uninsured, but with the possible benefit of maybe having other money available in the state for other reasons. So this is just to point out that this variability occurs throughout the country. Some states uh, are very restrictive in who can get on Medicaid. Some states are very permissive. And so it varied a great deal. Um, I'm going to make one other point, which is that years ago, uh, it was decided that most children would be largely covered by Medicaid. It was made pretty easy for them.
I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but that was what was called in the past the S-CHIP plan or the State Children's Health Insurance Plan. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because all of this has recently changed with the passing of the Affordable Care Act, or what is known as Obamacare. And I want to focus just for a few minutes on those changes because they influence how we think about Medicaid moving forward. So I'm just going to go ahead and erase some of the stuff we wrote here about how different states treat Medicaid differently, and then focus for a minute on the changes um, that have been brought into law beginning in 2010 with the passing of the Affordable Care Act. So that's going to write the Affordable Care Act, uh, commonly also called Obamacare. And Obamacare changed Medicaid in the following way. They said that we would like to create a uniform standard for who gets Medicaid. And so what they said was that all Americans, if they are making 133% of the federal poverty limit or less, could qualify for Medicaid. Very importantly, they said it didn't matter whether or not you had kids. If you were even a single adult, you could still get on Medicaid. This seriously expanded the number of people who would qualify for Medicaid. Some estimates are that there should be millions and millions of people, maybe even up to, to 10 to 16 million people could now get Medicaid. So it expanded eligibility. And finally, what they did was the federal government, meaning the U.S. government based in Washington, D.C., would pay uh, 90 to 100 percent of the cost of expanding that. So this is very different. It really essentially federalized the Medicaid expansion. So it didn't really require a lot of money from states other than the 10% that they'd have to pay after several years. So this was really a new way of thinking about who among the poor and families should get Medicaid. The thing is that in a Supreme Court challenge, it was decided, however, that the federal government could not force Medicaid expansion. So you could not force it. it turned out that some states were worried about this 10%. They thought even that was too much to ask for uh, from their state revenues to expand Medicaid for the eligible population. As a result, moving forward from here, we really will see a population of two different kinds of states. About half the states fall, will fall into this category and the other half will fall into this category. This category has accepted expansion and so in those states most um, of the uh, benefits, the extra money from the federal government will come through over time. This other half of states have chosen not to expand. And so in those states, Medicaid will continue pretty much as it always has, with the federal government giving some money and the states deciding who they're going to allow to get onto Medicaid. Um, and over time, uh, these states may then have, they'll get the up to 90 to 100 percent of the cost of that from the government to start with, and then long term will have to come up with 10 percent on their own. These states will continue um, to get, since they're not expanding, will just kind of continue to have to um, pay for their existing Medicaid rolls the way they always have.